Welcome to the Matt Kuda Photography Podcast, a podcast about nature and wildlife photography in your own backyard and throughout the United States. Welcome back to the podcast. In this episode, we're going to discuss the landscape. The landscape, to me, is very is a very important part of who I am as a photographer. Uh, it's it's oftentimes I think where many of us start our photography adventure. It's relatively easy to get into. It's relatively easy to photograph as far as once you learn a few of the of the techniques. And it's a very peaceful experience. I started photographing landscapes back in probably I, I guess about 1996 somewhere around there in the analog days and I was immediately hooked by the images that I could create I'm not saying I'm a great a great landscape photographer but it's something that I thoroughly enjoy and I want to pass along any knowledge that I can that could help you so let's get into talking about first and foremost you know let's get the gear out of the way because there are specific pieces of gear that really help you in the landscape photography side of things first I want to talk about the camera okay the camera is actually an important piece in my opinion to the landscape puzzle Long ago, uh, photographers uh, like Ansel Adams, then more recently, photographers like Art Wolf, made the idea of the landscape really artistic in my mind. They used large format cameras. They used medium format cameras. The bigger the film the better the quality back then. And the same holds true today with modern DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. I am generally speaking going to get a much cleaner and better image from a full frame camera than I am an APS-C. So we're talking about a totally different game here. We're talking about a game changing thing here we're going from a wildlife perspective where I want to get as close as I can to the animal without changing the animal's behavior to a sweeping scenic with all this detail and you're going to want to make large prints you know uh, 20 by 30s and larger it's a it's a different game and one of the things that I recommend is that you use a large sensor at least as large as you can afford and so I, I really recommend a full frame camera for photographing scenics in general I'm not saying you can't use an APS-C I have on several occasions I'm not saying you can't use a micro four thirds there are guys out there doing it I'm just saying that I recommend a larger sensor and you can get fairly inexpensive full frame cameras out there and the good news is, as a as a landscape scenic photographer, you don't have to worry about having a high shutter speed. Okay, not as much. You still do some, but not as much. And so you can use a little older full frame camera and get away with it. Um, you know, you could use the 5D2, for example. Uh, you can use a Canon uh, EOS EOS 6D. Another good a good choice. The 5D Mark III is a good choice. It's a little on the expensive side, but it's still a good choice. The the new 5D Mark IV coming out is a great choice. The old 1DS Mark II is a good choice. The 1DS Mark III is a good choice. So you see, I, I'm kind of selecting cameras here that are full frame and good image quality. Again, not saying you can't use APS-C. You can do it. You can use APS-H. 
but not only does the full frame give you better image quality, but many of the lenses. So let's talk about the lenses real quick that you would need for a landscape. Landscape photography really runs the gamut on lenses. Uh, a lot of people think that landscape photography is all about the wide angle lens. And granted, uh, if you're going for those large sweeping landscapes, certainly a wide angle is a good choice. But you can use many other types of lenses. But before I get into the other types of lenses, I want to explain why a full frame camera is a, is a, is a, is a good choice even with lenses. Many of the lenses that are made today on the wide angle side are designed to be used with full frame cameras. And because of that, you know, you want to get that sweeping landscape. The, the larger that sensor that's made for that specific wide angle lens, the, the, the grander the landscape is going to be. So that's one important aspect. If I were to use an APS-C camera, for example, with a Canon 17 to 40, well, that's kind of a game changer, right? Because what we're talking about here on APS-C, if I took that that 17 to 40, which is an awesome landscape lens for full frame, and I put that on an APS-C camera, now I've gone from a 27 to a 64 millimeter. It's still usable, but the the wide side is a lot less wide than a lot of people like to see in a landscape so that's a that's a consideration now if you want to use an APS-C you have a couple lenses available on the Canon side you have the the venerable 10 to 22 EFS mount and you have the 10 to 18 which is a new lighter uh, plastic lens that gives you roughly that 16 to 35 millimeter equivalent for 35 for a full frame uh, camera. So, <clears throat> what kind of lenses? Like I said, for what do I recommend? Honestly, for sweeping landscapes on a full frame camera, I like the 17 to 40 L. Uh, it is 749 dollars new. But on the used market, you can pick these up for five, five hundred dollars, somewhere around there. There's the 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 other well-known Canon lens, the 16 to 35 L, which is going to run you a considerable amount of money. That's that lens is fifteen hundred dollars new, and honestly, I I'm not sure the benefit of 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 fifteen hundred dollars is worth it. I'm not sure that there's a there's a good return on investment there. The biggest dis the biggest uh, uh, advantage to the 16 to 35 is maybe slightly better image quality, but it's weather sealed. The 17 to 40 is not weather sealed. So, on the on the APS-C side of things, I would recommend the 10 Canon 10 to 22 EFS. Uh, I would recommend. Really, there are some other options available there on the third party side. I would look at Sigma. They have some good offerings. Uh, I didn't write anything down on the Sigma side because I'm not as familiar with their wide angles. But they have some great stuff. There's some Tamron lenses out there that are pretty good. There's a Tekina out there that's pretty good. So, you know, do your homework on that. <clears throat> I'm only going to talk about the Canon side because that's what I've been using. Um, the other side of things is it's not just about the wide angle. Right, it, it, landscapes are not just about wide angle. That's a good place to start, certainly. But there's so much more to a landscape, and there are times when you have this very wide, sweeping mountain range in front of you that you want to isolate portions of of said landscape. And so, for that, I recommend the Canon 70 to 200 f/4 L. Uh, this is a fabulous lens. Um, another good one uh, for this is the is the Sigma 70 to 200. Both are really great lenses, and they're fairly expensive. You're talking around a thousand dollars new. But the good news is, on the used market, you can pick these up for five and six hundred dollars. So, 
a big cost savings there. A lot of people don't realize that you can actually use your 50 millimeter lens in landscapes. There are times and there are certain situations, waterfalls is an example I've used them on, uh, where yeah, that 50 millimeter comes in handy. It's a, for one thing, it's it's probably your sharpest lens that you own, no doubt about it. Um, that right there is a is a great reason to use it. But there are times that you just want that that quote normal lens look, and you just have to experiment with that. It's just a matter of experimentation. And with digital cameras, I mean, you can experiment and, and experiment and experiment, and not cost you any money. So that's kind of what I'm recommending on the lens side. On the camera side, certainly, like I said, the, uh, if I were going to go APS-C, I didn't mention APS-C cameras. If I were to go APS-C on the landscape side, I would probably steer you away from the DSLRs in general. Now, I'm not talking about full frame. I'm talking about crop sensors. I personally, right now, I think Sony probably has the best the best APS-Cs for the landscape, honestly. If I, if I were going to go that direction, that's the way I would go. Um, sorry, Canon. I love you, but your APS-C sensors are junk. Um, that's just my personal opinion. What else? What else do I need for equipment? Certainly, the, the probably the most important besides your camera and lens is the tripod. Uh, tripod in my in my mind is the one of the most important tools of the landscape photographer. It does a few things. One, you're often out there early in the morning so you're in a low light condition. Um, you need something to keep your camera stable. You don't want to move for long exposures. Okay, so it's kind of a no-brainer. You need a tripod. Uh, get a very sturdy tripod. There's a reason for that. When you take uh, slower exposures and one fifteenth of a second or you know, one thirtieth, one eighth, one fourth, when you get down into there and longer, even s slight vibrations in uh, the legs of your tripod can carry up to your camera and cause just slight softness in your image and that is not desirable it's not desirable for the most part in in uh, landscape photography so definitely get a sturdy tripod a heavy tripod is better than a light tripod yeah, that comes down to you know weighing the pros and cons if you're going to be out on a long hike you may not want a big heavy tripod but if you're just going to get out of your car next to the road and take some shots a heavy tripod works great. The other important thing that you want to consider as far as equipment goes is a cable release. You don't need to spend a lot of money on a cable release. It can be the cheap aperture. It's not aperture, it's aperture. Uh, it's available on Amazon all day long. I got links to it on my website. Five bucks. You know, you got yourself a cable release. That's pretty much it for the basic equipment that you're going to need. All that stuff right there it could get you started. Now, if you don't have a cable release, you forget it, you leave it at home, what do you do? Well, that's what the timer's for, right? You have a two-second timer on your, uh, on your camera, go ahead and use that. Another thing that I find very useful in the DSLR world is live view live view get a camera that has live view for landscapes because one it locks your mirror up out of the way when you're in live view and two it allows you to just stand back and look at the back of your camera and then look at your scene and look at the back of your camera and look at your scene it's a lot more akin to to what they used to do in the old days and what Ansel Adams used to do with his large format camera is you would actually be standing behind your camera and looking at this large image, albeit upside down, you're looking at this large image and you could compose better. So definitely recommend the live view. I think it's a great feature for the landscape photographer. Let's talk about some specific types of, of landscape photography.
Now, for me, I tend to lean more toward things with water in the scene. So I, I tend to shoot more waterfalls, for example, uh, lakes, rivers, things like that. I, I personally like to see water. And in North Carolina, we have, I, don't know, I think it's estimated now, I think the latest estimate I heard was over a 1,000 waterfalls in North Carolina. And so that's a natural choice for, for landscape photographers in North Carolina. And so I have the most experience with waterfalls. I consider myself more of a waterfall landscape photographer than, say, a sweeping vista or, or you know, large landscape photographer. With waterfalls, first and foremost, it's about the time of day, okay? Why is time of day so important? <clears throat> time of day is important with waterfalls not just because it's great lighting, because it is great lighting, but it's also very important because once the water hits, or once the sun hits the water on the waterfall, it becomes an exposure nightmare. You have a very high contrast scene, uh, a very, really, an a, a high dynamic range, which makes it suitable for HDR photography. And so, you want to get there when there's that nice soft light on the water. You don't want that harsh sun hitting that water and reflecting all that light back to you. I usually will like to, I like to be at the waterfall no later than sunrise. Um, that's that's where I start taking photographs. And I will usually end photography sometime around nine uh, at at the at the latest, even before that, usually around eight. And I will just work. I will work that waterfall for for a good two hours. Um, I'll be using a lot of low angle photography. I'll be trying to isolate parts of the scene. Usually, when I when I when I first get to a waterfall, this is what I do. Okay, I, I generally would just kind of look at it. Uh, I kind of size it up, and I look at what interesting things I have around me at my feet. There might be some boulders there. There might be a fallen tree, a, an old log that's wet there. There might be a, a, a smaller cascade in front of me that leads into the scene, into the waterfall. I will look for these types of things first. And I'll start back away from the waterfall. And I'll try to use a wider angle lens and incorporate some of these boulders, wet boulders, wet logs, small cascades into the foreground. And I will use that to lead your eye in back toward the actual waterfall. That's one technique that I'll use right away. I, I almost always start there. After I'm satisfied that I've taken enough shots of that, I will then begin to move closer to the waterfall itself. And I will start to isolate the waterfall. I will use longer lenses uh, like a like my 50 or my my uh, 70 to 300 or my 70 or 70 to 200 or something like that and I'll try to start isolating pieces of the waterfall especially if it's a large waterfall and I'll try to actually get in so tight eventually that it's just a tiny piece of this waterfall that I'm photographing so that's kind of how I work a subject. I work my waterfall subject. Now, the next most important thing besides time of day is it's all about controlling the water. What do I mean by that? Water can present, be presented to the viewer in several ways. Well, two main ways, really. But there are several variants of it. The first way is I can freeze the water's motion. So you've seen pictures like this, um, where there's a massive waterfall and the photographer has just stopped the action with a high shutter speed and frozen all those little droplets of water in the air. That's one way. Okay, I've seen some very effective photography done that way. I tend to lean more the other direction. I like a little bit more of a, uh, a motion, a flow 
to the water even going so far I'll, I'll start out with uh, usually around a half second and I'll just keep extending that that shutter speed and length of the of the exposure until I like what I'm seeing I might you know some days I might like to see more of a cotton candy effect that's generally gonna be out there around eight seconds uh, some days if it's a really fast heavy waterfall I might do a quarter of a second or an eighth of a second but I want to capture that motion now the trick to this the trick to doing this is to not only capture motion but to capture detail in the water as well if you do if you go full cotton candy okay you won't have any detail in the water it'll just look like a cloud of water and that might be good for some things you might be going for that generally though I like to have a little bit of detail in the water I like to see the water flow so I like to see a little shadow in the water I like to be able to see places in the water where I can see through the water back to the rocks behind the waterfall I'm, I'm trying to, to to have my cake and eat it too basically I want I want that blur but I also want some detail how can I do that well the old school way in the 35 millimeter film days was you pretty much had to expose for the water highlights and bracket various shots bracketing is simply exposing one way or the other uh, so I might start at f16 at uh, a fourth you know a fourth of a second then my next shot might be f16 at a half a second then my next shot might be f16 at a fourth of a second or I might try even a second or two seconds I might bracket like that trying to get that ideal shot well in today's world we have a couple more tools available we have that but we also have HDR <clears throat> and HDR is simply a high dynamic range photography and I don't go crazy here my goal is not to create this cartoony looking grungy looking scene that's not my goal at all my goal is to always make it look like the human eye saw it so when I'm taking a picture of, of, of waterfall I may do six or eight bracketed images of that waterfall and later I will either combine it using an HDR program or more likely what I will do is I'll just combine it manually in uh, Photoshop with mask maskings I may do a I may do a, a video podcast or a vlog on that at some point in the future because it's kind of hard to explain over audio <clears throat> but I'll combine those images together so that the user feels like or the viewer feels like hey that's what it looked like I visited that falls five years ago and that's what I saw so and there's all different variations you can do here on creativity and so I'm not saying you have to do it this way or this is the best way it's just the way I like to work waterfalls and landscapes you really start entering into the artistic world you really start to be an artist really as you as you bend light to to where you want it to go and how you want it to look and so <clears throat> you know that's that's the deal there now what you must have and I will say you must have this you must have a circular polarizer why is a circular polarizer so doggone important in waterfall photography <clears throat> well what happens is when a rock gets wet okay water at waterfalls everything is wet especially large waterfalls you're getting that mist off it everything is soaking wet the leaves the rocks the logs what happens with these rocks is when they get wet and light hits it it creates this sheen this bright ugly nasty lifeless sheen you need that polarizer 
to cut through that reflection. That's all polarizer does. Okay, in its simplest form, all a polarizer does, it reduces reflection. Okay, Fisher fishermen use polarizers. They use polarized sunglasses. Why? So it cuts down the reflection on the surface of the water, and they can see down and see the bass or other species of fish that they want to that they want to catch. It's all about removing that reflection for the fishermen. And it's the same way with photography. It's all about removing that reflection. The other thing it does in the old school days, and we're going to talk more later on in this podcast about analog photography. In the old school days, it actually increased the contrast, uh, which was very helpful when you're shooting film. Now, in today's world, we don't have to worry about that so much because we can just add some contrast in Photoshop or Lightroom but in the uh, in the older days or in the analog days and still today if you want to shoot analog you need to think about contrast um, even though you can scan it in later and then change the contrast it's better to do everything in camera in my opinion there are some other filters that may be useful if you really are having trouble getting a long shutter speed let's say you want an 8 second shutter speed you can add ND filters. An ND filter is simply a neutral density filter and all it is it's best described for for new folks or even for folks that have been doing it a while it's best described as a pair of sunglasses for your camera. All it does is it cuts down the amount of light entering your lens and so that allows you to get longer shutter speeds. Simple. There's nothing there's no magic about it. It's a pair of sunglasses for your camera. Okay, so that's how waterfalls are taken. By the way, highly encourage you to come to North Carolina to photograph waterfalls. We have one of the best selections of waterfalls in the world. Um, feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to take you out uh, sometime. We can arrange something monetarily to do that or hey I might even do it for free it's hard to say depends on what kind of mood you, you catch me in but it's a, it's a great place to photograph waterfalls it's 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 a magical place western North Carolina is a mixture between a rugged western mountain and a beautiful northern uh, Allegheny type mountain it's it's just a lush sometimes almost rainforest like mountain area with lots and lots of waterfalls so yeah give me a shout we'll we'll uh we'll get a bunch of people together and go shoot waterfalls someday okay so let's move on to the next type of uh the next type of thing which is which next type of landscape photography vistas i have the least experience with vistas i kind of know what i'm doing with a vista but I don't get out, often get out and shoot vistas. We do have some beautiful vistas here in North Carolina as well. But what uh, what are you looking for in a vista? First of all, time of day is extremely important in vista photography. There are two types of scenes that I generally, well really three types of scenes that I generally see in vista photography. One, of course, is the sunrise. Uh, the, the sunrise with the sun in front of you. You know, the big glow behind the mountains. And, you know, you've seen these big sweeping landscapes with the mountains in the background. The sun's barely just almost ready to crest the mountaintop. It has this beautiful aura around it. That type. The next type that you're going to run into is sunrise but sun behind your shoulder and lighting the vista this is another particularly beautiful type of scene you're getting that nice morning sunshine sweeping across that vista and it's just it gives you this golden just beautiful feel to the mountains the other type is sunset and sunset can be a lot like a sunrise uh, but it, it it is different. There there seems to me 
sunsets oftentimes have a much more red glow or orange glow than a sunrise does. You're more often to run into that beautiful red coloring. So it's, there's those those things are what you're looking for. But please, 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 time of day is crucial in vistas. You must be up before sunrise. You must be at the scene before sunrise. Have everything set up. Bring your flashlight. Bring your bring somebody else with you so you're not scared to death. <laughs> and uh, and and photograph that vista because that's the time to do it. The other thing is I want to talk about about landscape photography is it is very very time consuming and it is very addictive. What I mean by that is you will spend a great deal of time looking for the right light. So much so that it will take up every Saturday of the year if you if you let it. But you can also take some great images and it's those great images that keep you coming back for more uh, the 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 big landscape photographers that I've heard interviewed that's the one of the things that they say is when, it's that one image that one image that you took that whole year that just made it all worthwhile so anyway that's that's kinda of the it of it there there are other types of landscapes that I sometimes will shoot uh, one is an agricultural landscape. Uh, it's man and nature. Uh, big beautiful barns sitting up on a hillside. You know, again sunrise, sunsets, even middle of the day you can get away with agricultural photographs. There's also intimate landscapes. Intimate landscapes are landscapes where let's say you're walking down a trail and off to the right here you see oh there's this little mossy area and some some beautiful ferns growing you might go in kind of closer and just take a photograph of those ferns or just take a photograph of the ferns and a couple of trees or you might see a log uh, with some some pretty flowers growing out of it or around it and you just you just show the flowers and part of the log that's an intimate landscape and these are fun I've done a couple of these I, I like I said I don't you, you know me I'm primarily I'm primarily a a wildlife photographer, although I do enjoy doing the occasional landscapes. So I, you know, I'm not a like I said, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. I've dabbled in these things over the years. I've got some pretty good photographs of of landscapes and waterfalls. So you know, I just want to leave that there for you. So I, you're you're welcome to ask me questions. You know, shoot me an email. You know, text me uh, on. Uh, any of the social media platforms but you know there are better wildlife or there are better certainly better uh, landscape photographers out there than I am so I wanted to discuss one more thing before we leave this whole this whole uh, landscape discussion I want to talk a little bit about analog landscapes what do I mean by that? I mean the, the term analog is kind of silly, really. It's just film. It's what it's what I shot with for many years. It, there is something I, I agree with people that there is something special about shooting film. Yes, it's a pain. Yes, it is uh, requires a little different skill set, although very similar to what you're doing with digital. And I'm just going to kind of recommend for some equipment and what you might need to uh, get started in, in analog uh, landscape photography. And again, feel free to ask questions on this. This is something I have quite a bit of experience in. Cameras. Mmm, cameras. Analog cameras. There's a lot of them out there on the used market. You know why? Because everybody dumped their analog camera when digital came out. Uh, what do I recommend? I'll tell you what I have. Maybe this will help you. I have several cameras from the uh, the film days. The first camera that I fell in love with 
is a camera that was made in the former Soviet Union called the Kiev 88. Now the Kiev 88 is a medium format camera. It shoots 6x6 film, 120 film, a square negative. It's a uh, it's it's a rugged camera. It's a it's it's an anchor. It's a boat anchor, man. The thing is just it weighs a ton. Uh, it's got a big prism in it. I'm I got a 65 millimeter lens for it. I used to have a an 80, but it bit the dust. Um, I've got a, a 65 millimeter, which is I think roughly the if I remember right, it's roughly the equivalent of a 35 millimeter lens on a 35 millimeter camera. Um, the advantage to shooting a, a, lar- a medium format camera like this is you have multiple backs that can be attached to the camera. So, if, so if you're out photographing with film, the idea was you could have a Polaroid back. You could have uh, for doing you know, instant images, so you can see what your scene is going to look like, what your exposure looks like. You know, that's what we had before we had LCDs on the back of our cameras. We had Polaroids. Um, it has a... Uh, you can shoot uh, a positive film back, or what what people often refer to as slides, although that's not an accurate uh, representation of what it is. These are transparencies. Uh, slide is a specific 35 millimeter film, a positive film in a case, in a little slide case. So you can shoot the transparency film, you can shoot uh, you know, black and white. So you could have three different backs loaded up with three different film types. So when you went out to photograph your waterfall, you could shoot it in color, you could shoot it in black and white, and you could shoot it with transparency positive film. Huge, huge advantage there in the in the film days. That's why everybody sought out the Hasselblads, and this is a a copy of the old Hasselblad 1000. It's an exact ripoff, actually, because the Soviet Union the Soviet Union did not believe in copyright or trademarks, anything like that. So they just ripped off anything that that looked good. The AK-47, of course, is a ripoff gun based on a uh, German design. So, one thing that the, that the Russians or the so- in the Soviet Union were known for is creating some very rugged stuff. This is made out of steel. It's made out of uh, industrialized rubber. It's, it is a tank. Okay? And I love it. I love it because of that. It's quirky. It's odd. I love it. So that's how my me that's what I shoot my medium format. Uh you can pick these up on eBay for about two to four hundred dollars for a full kit. I mean everything and on the four hundred dollar side of things you can even have a mirror lockup. That's one thing I forgot to mention earlier. One of the things that's very crucial in landscape photography, especially on the lo- on the longer exposures, is mirror lockup. And what that does is when you have an SLR or a DSLR, your mirror will come up right before you make the photograph and slap the top of the camera. What that mirror slap does is it creates micro vibrations that go throughout your camera and will affect your image. It will actually make it look soft. We talked about that when you use live view you have automatic mirror lockup. Well on the older cameras like the Kiev 88, the modified Kiev 88s, they had a mirror lockup lever on it that you would pull up and the and the mirror would stay up during your exposure and would prevent that. Now that's very important on the medium format cameras because you have a very big mirror and when that thing goes ka you know, and flaps up, you know, hits the top of your camera, that creates a lot of vibration. So one of the reasons that this Kiev 88 without mirror lockup is not does not make a very good waterfall camera. Other types of photography, great. Waterfalls, eh, not so great. Unless you were to shoot maybe a 400 ISO film or something like that. Um, the other camera, the other cameras that I have, I have a Canon EOS 1N 
which is can be picked up on the used market for about 99 bucks right now. It's a 35 millimeter. It has mirror lockup. It only shoots at three frames per second, but you don't need that for landscapes. Okay, it's a good solid 35 millimeter camera. I recommend. Um, I also have an old Yashica um, Super 2000. I have a, which I don't really recommend that camera, by the way. If you find one on the used market, it was an entry level uh, Yashica camera. I also have a Contax 167MT, which is an excellent camera uh, that, that was designed to use Zeiss lenses with. And uh, ask me if I have any Zeiss lenses. No, I do not. It also takes the less, uh, the the cheaper Yashica lenses, and that's what I used on it. I no longer use that camera. It just sits. It's part of my history. It was my first real SLR that shoots uh, three frames per second, and you know it was it was really my first step into the the semi pro world. Okay, let's move on. That's kind of what's available camera-wise that I recommend. Um, you know, you can also pick up, by the way, you can also pick up other inexpensive uh, medium format cameras. I used to have an RB67 from Amiya. That's a good one. I used to have, or I, 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 I know other people that have Bronicas. That's a can be picked up fairly cheap on the market. Do be careful with the lenses. These lenses are very old. They oftentimes have fungus. You need to get lenses that do not have fungus. Fungus will ruin your photograph. Trust me, it's awful. Okay, let's move on to the film. What types of film would I use for shooting landscapes and waterfalls and so forth? <clears throat> well, there are some pretty good ones still on the market. I will generally buy them at B&H Photo. Ektar 100 from Kodak is a, is a good, solid low speed film for doing landscapes. It has good color rendition, a little snappier color, and it's recommended for film scanning. So it's it's optimized for that. Uh, the grain structure is quite tight. It makes a good film. On the black and white side, of course, Ilford Delta 100 is still a very popular film. T-Max 100 is still a very popular film for landscapes. There are many others out there. It's 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 really, you know, film is part of what makes your your analog experience what it is. The film is very very important. Generally, your your body, your camera body, is just a black box. The film and the lenses are everything in uh, film photography. So <clears throat> stick to lower speed films unless you're going for a special effect. Stick to lower speed films like I don't even know if they have any 50 out there anymore. They used to have 25 speed and 50 speed. I used to use 25 speed film back in the day for doing waterfalls and so forth because it was such low grain and just a, a beautiful, beautiful, create a beautiful image. I think 100 is as low as they make now. How do you get from, and this is the point, this is the hard part about the whole thing. How do you get from your film to your website? Well, there are Epson scanners out there, there are flatbed scanners available. I have a, I have a couple Epson flatbed scanners that I use that have special film carriers in them that allow you to put film in and scan it. Uh, there's special software that comes with that um, that, that helps control the color casting created by the orange mask that's on color film for example. You can scan it there, you can you can take that and, and uh, uh, create a digital image from that and then post that to the internet or sell it or whatever. But what I really like about film is not that. It's not the hybrid process. Film is all about making a print. It always was. It always has been. 
film in my mind has not is not finished until you have a print in front of you so here's what I recommend that you learn to do if you really want to go down this road if you really truly want to go down the analog road and I know there's folks out there that love it one you need to learn to develop your own film your own black and white film that's important uh, because why is that important well first of all it's a big cost savings in the long term second of all the film processing has as much to do about how your image looks as the film itself does how long you put it in the, through the developer you know <clears throat> what types of uh, of film that you use how dense that negative is how thin the negative is all that has to do with making your final print and so that's why I say it's important um, the other thing is if you really really want to be old school if you want to go Ansel Adams on this thing you really need to print your own prints and in order to do that you are going to have to create a dark room in your house or know somebody that has a dark room and you basically have to go in there and create these prints I did this for many years I was actually uh, Oh, let's take let's go back a few years. Um I started out in photography in the wet dark room. I literally processed probably 15 rolls of film a week and printed those for our university publications, uh, yearbooks, uh, newspapers. We had a couple different newspapers at our, at our school. Um one of them was of course our our student newspaper we also had a liberty journal which used some of our photographs from time to time and so I got a lot of experience in darkroom and it is kind of a meditative experience for me um, I miss it I'll probably never get back to it again I do do some analog photography from time to time but I will never go back to that wet darkroom because I just don't have the space I live in a 1300 square foot house I don't have a lot of money and that's not gonna happen okay but I'll tell you what if you got the space and the time it is so cool uh, to, to see you know what got me hooked on photography originally was actually looking at the first print come out of that developer and see it just literally emerge from a blank piece of paper now it wasn't really blank we just it looks blank to the human eye when you put it put that process that film in that film developer and it processes that emulsion on that paper and you see that image it just hooked me right there it hooked me if it wasn't for film you know if we had if it was digital back then I don't know if I would have got into photography maybe I don't know but I think that whole process just got me interested in it and so if you want to go down that road I have no problem with people that go down that road you know some people out there they're very critical oh why would you ever want to go back to film blah 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 look dude it's fun honestly it's fun for people that like process for people that like to to get into you know uh, the chemistry involved in it it is fun and you can do a lot. You can do a lot of dodging and burning. You can do stuff that Ansel Adams used to do. You can really get into it at a totally different level. And there's been a resurgence of this. There's been a lot of people getting back into film photography. Um, I'm going to put a plug in for another podcaster out there. Uh, Chris Marquardt uh, has a book out on, on just this thing. I, I forget what it's called. And I think it's the... Film photographer's guy uh, handbook or something like that, uh, but it's out online. You can look it up. Just look up Chris Marquart, and he's got a whole book that he's written for the digital guy who's getting back into or is trying to understand analog photography. So it's not dead by any means. It is a different medium. It is a medium that many people probably aren't interested in. It's a niche kind of field right now and if you want to do it 
You have my blessing. Go for it. I will say this before I before we move on to know your subject. Analog did something for me. Analog taught me how to create images, how to expose properly. Because if you didn't get it right in camera, you didn't get it right. There was no going in the Lightroom and cranking up an underexposed photograph to get something usable. That just really doesn't happen. If you tried to do that in old school analog, if you had a image that was underexposed by two stops, you'd have to add a ton of contrast, you'd have to do all this stuff in the dark room, you, you still would have a, just a grainy, nasty image. So there, you had to get it right in camera, and there was a lot of technique involved, and there was a lot of, there's frankly some guesswork involved sometimes, because, you know, lighting changes, it does weird things, but because of that, I learned how to make a better photograph, and so if if it does nothing else, if if analog photography does nothing else for you, it will teach you how to make a good photograph. I guarantee you that much. Okay, the sound you just heard was that of the morning dove. According to Cornell's Lab of Ornithology, the morning dove is a graceful, slender-tailed, small-headed dove that's common across the continent of North America. Morning doves perch on telephone wires, they forage for seeds on the ground, their flight is fast and bullet straight. Their soft, drawn-out calls sound like laments. When taking off, their wings make a sharp whistling or whinnying. Morning doves are the most frequently hunted species in North America. Morning doves fly fast on powerful wing beats, sometimes making sudden ascents, descents, and dodges, their pointed tails stretching behind them. The morning dove what a beautiful bird often overlooked as common what an amazing creature that God gave us with the morning dove who doesn't like to hear that just soft call that lamenting call which is where we get the term morning dove from it's not morning m-o-r-n-i-n-g it's m-o-u-r as in to mourn for something it's a very mournful lamenting call and it makes you feel comforted yet somewhat uneasy at the same time a very interesting bird um, a very soft and beautiful bird the closer you get to this bird with your lenses the, clo the, the more impact this bird has uh, the softness of its feathers the, the subtle almost iridescence at times uh, almost a pinkish hue that's mingled in with the feathers uh, just a beautiful bird soft just dove eyes you know those just uh, those just beautiful doe like eyes uh, awesome bird how do you photograph this bird okay <clears throat> I love this bird I love to photograph this bird and images of morning doves will sell. Why? Because they're still hunted. <laughs> the morning dove is hunted uh, still in the south of the United States especially. It's, it's considered a game bird. I don't hunt. I don't enjoy hunting. I don't enjoy killing things. It's not my thing. But I do photograph them. And what I can tell you is they will come to your backyard. They are, in my mind, a backyard birding opportunity and one you shouldn't pass up. They will come and eat seed. They will certainly eat black sunflower seeds. They will eat other seeds. Um, generally, when I'm trying to attract a morning dove to my backyard, I will use a platform feeder, what's called a platform feeder. 
simply a platform feeder is a platform. It's a it's more of a trough like design or a, yeah, more of a trough like design instead of your traditional feeder. It's it's a big square platform with sides on it. Sometimes you see octagonal platforms if you buy them from the store. You can make your own very easily. And you fill that up with seed. And that's what they like. Because they're, they're ground birds. Uh, generally speaking, a morning dove is a ground bird. In other words, they, they tend to forage on the ground. And because of that, they, they're not big on perching. They can perch. They perch fine. But because they're designed to forage the ground, you need a platform feeder to attract them. You can photograph them on perches near the your platform feeder. You can photograph them on logs on the ground. You can build up mounds of dirt and put seed in various places on that on that mound. Um, there's just many ways you can photo. You can photograph them in the air. There are people that have uh, photographs of them in flight. That's a that's a tricky one. They're fast. They're a very fast bird. They're actually um, super fast and uh, like the like Cornell's uh, website said they they're bullet they're like a bullet they, they travel in one direction they they can dodge but they're so fast they use their spe- their speed to get away from predators sadly a lot of these are killed by cats uh, most morning doves in our neighborhood are actually killed by cats and uh, I don't mean natural cats I mean house cats because people leave them out uh, in the yard, and don't get me started on that whole thing. Uh, that's very irritating to say the least. But yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, hey, you can photograph these guys all day long. They're in, they're in great numbers. They're not over overly hunted. They they're a beautiful bird. Please, please get out there and photograph these great creatures. Well, that's about all I have for today. Please continue to do what you've been doing. Please click subscribe if you haven't already done so. Please get the word out about the podcast on uh, your favorite social media. And uh, we'll we'll take this thing to the next level. Thanks for listening. Make it a great day. And get out there and enjoy nature. Bye-bye. Music for this episode was provided by Dr. Turtle.